All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today I'm giving you my rapid reaction to the Falcons 20 to 16 win over the Detroit Lions in week 16. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong, however, on Twitter, at Falcfans, and of course, the host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Falcons is a rapid reaction where I come at you a few hours after the Falcons week 16 win over the Detroit Lions by a score of 20 to 16 to give you my general takeaways. We'll give you the game summary, give you the highlights and the lowlights for those of you that watch the game and need a reminder or those of you that did not catch the game then i'll hand out my different grades for the offense the defense and special teams in this game and then i'll give you sort of my big takeaway from this game and basically you know it's not going to be an overly positive performance the falcons got the win but it was you know as they say, an ugly win or whatever the case may be. They showed resiliency, but we'll get into that at the end of the show. And and to me, this game kind of reflects that whole, you know, talent versus coaching narrative that we've been talking ad nauseum about all season long. So we'll get more into that. But uh, before we get into that game summer, I do want to thank all of you guys for making Lockdown Falcons your first listen each and every day. Of course, Lockdown Falcons is free and available in a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, and Spotify. And of course, now Lockdown Falcons is free and available on YouTube. You can catch this rapid reaction on YouTube before you can catch the audio version of the podcast, just like you can catch all of the video versions of the podcast, usually a few hours before the audio version of the podcast uh, is posted. So definitely an incentive for you to just subscribe to the Locked on Falcons YouTube channel and make sure when you do, you leave a comment, you give us a like and all that stuff. So jumping in to the game summary, you know, the big positive, the big takeaway is I'm I'm glad for the Falcon fans that did show up at Mercedes-Benz Stadium to finally see this team win a game in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I, I saw the stat where it was the first win for the team in that stadium in like 392 days or something like that. So basically 13 months or whatever the case may be. And, you know, you know, I thought going into this game, the Falcons offense would be mostly fine because the Lions would not be really challenge them up front in the ways that we've seen several teams over the last couple of weeks challenge them. But that was not the case on the opening drive as the Lions were able to generate three sacks on that opening drive. Um, and it uh, technically you can say, you know, one of them was a rollout where Matt Ryan decided to keep the ball and was tackled behind the line of scrimmage uh, for a tackle for loss. And that counted as a sack. But then you saw on a second down uh, where Aleem McNeil, the Lions rookie nose tackle, beat Matt Hennessy um, for a sack. And then on third down, the Lions dial up pressure and Austin Bryant got home for a sack and that forced the Falcons to punt. Then the Lions proceeded to drive the length of the field on a methodical 13 play drive that took uh, roughly seven and a half minutes of game time and ultimately settled for a 26 yard field goal from kicker Riley Patterson. The Lions converted three third downs on that drive, but did not convert the fourth third down attempt, uh, which basically, you know, is the mantra of the bin, but don't break uh, style of defense that Dean Pease, you know, wants to have here in Atlanta and the Falcons were able to bend, but not break uh, and, you know, force the Lions to have to, uh, you know, settle for three points. Uh, Eventually the Lions offense had to mess up uh, more so than anything else. But uh, then after that, the Falcons and Lions exchanged three and outs with the first quarter coming to a close. And the Falcons offense finally started to get things going at the start of the second quarter. They were able to convert a QB sneak on a second and one to start the quarter. Then Marvin Hall had his first catch in a Falcons uniform in 2021 with a 10 yard gain a couple of plays later. Then the Falcons tried another QB sneak on the third and one uh, failed that. Um, and Arthur Smith basically said, you know what? It's fourth and one we're going for it. 
I'm getting back to the thing I do best, and that's calling toss plays on fourth and one. And this time it actually worked. You know, uh, they had the tight ends blocking on the edge instead of Russell Gage this time. Uh, and it seemed like Kyle Pitts, although he probably got away with a holding call, but they didn't throw the flag. Uh, and so you, Cordero Patterson was able to get to the outside and, and, and run untouched into the end zone for a six yard uh, touchdown run to give the Falcons a 10, three lead. Then the lions r- responded with another long drive that lasted over seven minutes, 11 play touchdown drive. Um, even though the lions had three false starts on this drive uh, that included a fourth and one, uh, uh, you know, attempt that they were about to go for, and they had a false start. And that forced them to punt the ball on fourth and six. But then the Lions were like, nope, we're not punting it. They faked it. And their punter, Jack Fox, hit uh, Kadero Hodge for a 21-yard gain. And then two plays later, Tim Boyle, the quarterback that started in place for Jerry Goff, who was out with COVID, uh, hit Amon Ross St. Brown for a 20-yard touchdown pass where A.J. Terrell basically went for the interception, missed it, uh, and St. Brown was able to power through a tackle at the goal line uh, to get the score. And the Lions took a 10-7 lead with about 344 left in the half. Hawkins got a couple of nice catches from Alama de Zacchaeus on the next drive that got them in the Lions territory, but then the drive stalled uh, just after the two minute warning. Uh, and that was due to pressure forcing Matt Ryan to throw the ball away on a third down. And young way came out and hit a 53 yard field goal to tie the game with a minute left in the half. And the Lions were able to basically move the ball to midfield, uh, but no further before halftime. And then to start out the second half, uh, they went a three and out. And then, you know, Kyle Pitts got going on that in, Suing Falcons drive, snagging Matt Ryan's first two passes uh, for a combined 27 yards. And then he added a third catch for 35 yards on a go ball where he made a nice one handed grab down the sideline. And then again, the Lions dialed up pressure on third down and that forced Matt Ryan to throw it away. So the Falcons could not continue the drive from that point after that big play from Pitts. And Young Wei Koo again came out for another field goal, this time from 48 yards, and that gave the Falcons a 13 10 lead. Then you had another seven minute drive from the Lions, uh, and they were able to convert two third downs and got a big play to St. Brown for 24 yards right after the second third down conversion, and that got the ball into the red zone. And the Falcons again bend but did not break, and the Lions were forced to settle for a 37 yard field goal from Patterson to tie the game with 13 to 13 with three minutes left in the third quarter. Mike Davis then started to get things going on the ensuing drive, had a couple of nice carries and a couple of nice catches to get the ball to midfield. You got another QB sneak from Matt Ryan on the second and one. Then Ryan hit Gage for a 13-yard uh, play. Then that was followed by a 19-yard gain by Kyle Pitts to convert a third down a few plays later. And that was at the start of the fourth quarter. And then on the next play, Matt Ryan hit uh, Hayden Hurst on a wheel route in the end zone, showed nice touch on that throw for a 12-yard catch and score, and that gave the Falcons a 20-13 to lead with 13 minutes left to go in the game. And then the Lions went on their longest drive of the game, 17 plays, took uh, about 10 and a half minutes. Uh, they got a 23-yard gain from Josh Reynolds, their wide receiver, early on the drive, but then the rest of it was basically dinking and dunking and running the football Uh, And the Lions were able to convert two fourth and ones uh, to keep that drive going. Uh, But the Falcons, again, once again, bent but did not break in the red zone. And this time, Jalen Hawkins was able to shoot a gap uh, and got a a good stop on Craig Reynolds uh, in the backfield for a three-yard loss on the third and two at the five-yard line. And then the Lions decided to kick the field goal uh, at the eight-yard line on a fourth and five uh, rather than going for it. Uh, and, you know, their kicker was able to make the 26 yarder uh, with under three minutes to go in the game, hoping that their defense would get a stop. And, you know, while that was a very questionable decision, very conservative decision from Dan Campbell, he almost proved to be a genius on that particular play because the Falcons falconed it up. Uh, and we've seen this team blow lead, several leads this season. Um, we've seen this team get very conservative after they blow those leads and it has not led to much positives. We've seen this team be aggressive when they blow those leads in the fourth quarter, when they need to go down the field and make sure they score. Um, And that's been better for this team. So what does Arthur Smith do? He decides I'm going to be conservative again, two runs by Cordero Patterson uh, gets them nothing. Then the lions use their timeouts. And so basically those two runs just bleed 10 seconds off the clock. Um, So we're not even getting to the two minute warning yet. Then the Falcons dial up, you know, as conservative a pass play as you can get. High percentage pass, screen pass to Russell Gage on the third and seven. 
uh, and Russell Gage fumbles the football. Uh, it's forced by Jalen Reeves Mabin, and it's recovered by Dean Marlowe at the Falcons 37 yard line with just over two minutes left in the game. It was a disastrous three play sequence, only took 20 seconds off the clock. And basically the Lions were poised to score. They, they ran the ball a couple of times. They got a third and two conversion. They were in the red zone with just under a minute to go. Then they got an eight yard pass to a backup wide receiver. And that got them down to the eight yard line. And then Tim Boyle, Tim Boyle. Uh, and telegraphed the throw over the middle to Khalif Raymond. Uh, Foya Aluakun, who had a team-high 14 tackles and looked good throughout the day, uh, read the quarterback's eyes and, and jumped the throwing lane, picked it off at the one-yard line, returned it a couple of yards before he, he slid down, and the Falcons basically, with the Lions out of timeouts, were able to go into victory formation with 33 seconds left on the clock and walked away with a win. So it wasn't a particularly pretty performance for the Falcons. You could certainly make the argument that the Falcons played down to the Lions level. I'm sure it's, plenty of people will sit here and say, you know, the talent disparity between the Falcons and Lions is pretty non-existent. And so this wasn't the Falcons playing down. You know, my official opinion that we'll get into later on the episode is that I definitely think the Falcons played down to the Lions level. Uh, and we'll talk about why people continue to be married to this talent deficient narrative when I think today's game clearly shows uh, that that was not the case. But, you know, as we continue today's episode, we'll get into the game grades, right? And uh, I'll talk about, you know, the different phases of the game, the offense, the defense, and special teams, and give out grades. And they're not going to be overly positive, but we'll get into that as we uh, continue today's Locked on Falcons episode. But before we get there, guys, it is the holiday season. The New Year's is right around the corner. And I know many of you are making those New Year's resolutions to eat healthier and, and do all the things to start your healthy lifestyle. And the best way to get that started is with Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market. If you want to have something that is both delicious and healthy, Built Bars are perfect for you. They're rich with decadent flavor. They're covered in chocolate. They taste just like a candy bar, if not better than a candy bar. They come in a variety of flavors. So many flavors that it's hard to choose. If you want holiday themed flavors, you got candy cane brownie bites, gingerbread eggnog, all available right now. You got other limited time flavors like coconut brownie chunk, which was voted the best Built Bar flavor back in March. Uh, and you also got the tried and true flavors like coconut almond, peanut butter, brownie, cherry, barcia, double chocolate, and so much more. Go choose your own, build your own box by going to built.com. And when you do use the promo code locked 15 and you'll get 15% off your order, that's locked 15 for 15% 15 off at built.com. So as we continue today's Locked On Falcons, giving out the game grades for the pass offense, rush offense, pass defense, rush defense, and special teams, yeah, I'll be up front with you guys. This is going to be probably the lowest graded uh, performance for the Falcons in a win so far this season. Um, and so for, starting with the pass offense, I gave them a C. Felt like it was a pretty middling performance. I thought Matt Ryan was mostly efficient in this game. He looked a little bit off the mark early in the game, but seemed to settle down a little bit there and, and was fine thereafter. You saw a nice game from Kyle Pitts. Uh, had his first 100-yard day since week seven. Finished with six catches for 102 yards. He passed Tony Gonzalez in terms of the single-season record mark for most receiving yards for a tight end uh, for the Falcons. And obviously... Now that he's at like 949 yards, a couple of yards away from a thousand yard season, only the second time a rookie tight end has done that. And obviously he's, you know, like 127 ish or so yards away from Mike Dicka's single season mark of 1,076 yards that he did in a 14 game season. But Kyle Pitts is going to have a couple of extra games and we'll have an opportunity to, to break that mark. So, uh, you know, a, a nice day for Kyle Pitts. It was a nice day for Russell Gage. You know, he had a bad drop and the fumble obviously were some negative plays, but other than that, he did a decent job uh, making a couple of plays. Of course, Marvin Hall, um, you know, was the, the the reason why the Falcons were able to win. I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, you know, unfortunately, he was underutilized. You did not see the Falcons pushing the ball down the field in this game like we saw last week where they were taking shots down the field and you wondered, hey, you know, instead of taking these shot plays um, to, to some of the players that the Falcons have, what if they did that with Marvin Hall? You hope to see that. You know, outside of that one deep throw that Matt Ryan had to Kyle Pitts, he didn't attempt a single other pass that went more than 15 yards in the air. So the Falcons tended to be a little bit conservative Probably some of that was owed to the, how the, the fact that they gave up three sacks on the opening drive. Other than that, it wasn't like that. That stat looks worse than it actually was. Um, but like, you know, the Lions were able to get effective pressure a lot 
early in this game, particularly on third downs. It seemed like every time they dialed up pressure, they were able to, you know, have a negative impact on the Falcons uh, offensive line. So uh, certainly, you know, maybe that was a reason why the Falcons were a little extra conservative because they did not have the confidence in their offensive line and their pass protection to hold up against what has been one of the worst pass rushes in the NFL, at least outside the state of Georgia. Uh, certainly, I think the Lions would take the cake for the worst pass rush that does not, uh, you know, participate on a team that plays their home games in the state of Georgia. Uh, so, you know, C grade for the pass offense. I gave the rush offense a D plus. Um, it wasn't their worst performance of the game, but given that, you know, you've seen this running attack, you know, do well over the last month, given that the Lions have one of the weaker run defenses in the NFL, it was very underwhelming. The Falcons finished with a success rate of 35% on 17 design runs, which again, 35% is not terrible. We've seen worse performances this season where we've seen games where the Falcons had like 18% success rate on like uh, a similar amount of runs or, or something like that. But it just felt to me like they couldn't really get much going. You know, Patterson had that nice touchdown run outside of that, you know, a couple of decent runs by Davis, like one or two. Uh, they It just looked like the same running uh, attack that we've seen throughout the season that has been one of the worst in the NFL. And it's hard for me, you know, again, maybe I'm grading it too harshly on a curve, but it just felt like a, a very piddling performance given, you know, the progress that we have seemingly shown over the course of the season to basically go back to what we were seeing out of this rushing attack for most of the season to me was a, a big step backwards. So uh, maybe in a vacuum, probably compared to other games, I've given probably better or worse games or equal games like C minuses earlier in the season. But because of those reasons, I'm giving them a D plus uh, past defense C minus. You know, Amon Ross St. Brown was the one guy that we needed to stop. We didn't really stop him. He finished with nine catches for 91 yards on the touchdown. It looked like both Richie Grant and Darren Hall were in the mix trying to slow him down. Did see some Sean Williams late in the game, although I wasn't sure if that was him in a nickel role or if that was him uh, basically acting as the third safety and, and taking over sort of as Jalen Hawkins' role in that third safety when Eric Harris was healthy. Um, so, you know, that'll be something I'll pay attention to when I watch the film. Uh, it seemed like for me watching the Falcons defense, particularly their past defense, they weren't really affecting the quarterback at all. And so basically they were getting stops or whatever you want to call them uh, when Tim Boyle was basically missing throws. He was very scattershot with his accuracy early in the game. Uh, so that'll be interesting to go back and watch the film and, and see if that changed over the course of the game or whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, Ola Kuhn made a great play at the end. Uh, again, that, that was, again, I'm not going to sit here and, and not, and take all the credit away from Olick and he made an absolutely outstanding play, but you know, Tim Boyle kind of, you know, telegraphed that throw all the way. Um, so it was an easy play, but again, you still got to make the play. So give the defense credit when they, when they make plays like that. So, uh, you know, again, it just felt like outside of that play and, and a couple of other mistakes and missed throws that Boyle had, there wasn't just a whole lot that the Falcons defense did. They had some pass breakups, guys broke up some passes and whatnot. So I can't say there was a terrible performance or anything like that, but it just, it just felt like a below average performance, especially given again, that we were dealing with the Lions team that, you know, just didn't have much at all, uh, you know, in, in terms of their passing game to really um, scare this defense um, even as one as weak and, and untalented as, as this Falcons one and to see them just basically go meh, you know, just have a very, very at best middling performance. Got to give them a C minus rush defense again, a D plus uh, the lions had a very conservative game plan in this game. And for the most part executed it pretty well. Like the lions ran the ball 33 times to 35 pass attempts. And I'm sure had they not been playing from behind late in the game that, would have been much more in favor of running the football. They dominated time of possession, 38 minutes to the Falcons, 22. They had a success rate of 52% on those 33 design runs. And that's part of the reason why they owned time of possession uh, with their sort of dink and dunk passing in, in their running game. And they were able to keep their offense mostly on, on, on schedule. You know, the Falcons run defense started out pretty well in the first quarter, shutting down the Lions run game. And their success rate in the first quarter was like 17%, but thereafter it was 59%. 
Uh, and so the Lions were able to do what they wanted to do. And we knew that going into this game, step one, given that they were going to have a backup quarterback, was going to be stopping the run. And the Falcons didn't do that for at least three out of the four quarters in this game. So it's hard for me to give them a positive grade. You know, it's a D plus. This game kind of broke down exactly how the Lions wanted to go. We'll talk about that a little bit later to wrap up today's episode. So let's move on to the special teams. Again, the special teams is the lone bright spot uh, for the Falcons. I gave them a B minus. Morstead had a good day punting. Ku obviously was excellent kicking field goals. The return game had a couple of nice returns. Um, you know, the Lions re- had a, a couple of decent returns as well. So the coverage units you maybe can knock a little bit. And obviously they had the fake punt that they converted. Although I think they just caught the Falcons sleeping uh, more so than just like a, a clear out executing them uh type of performance and uh, jack fox made a, a great throw and it was a great play call and, and all that various stuff uh so kudos to the lions for that i'm not going to ding them too harsh of that um you know it's not as bad as i would ding them if it was a block punt or something or like they ran a, a sweep or something like that and a guy ran the ball 15 yards uh you know and converted a fourth and in, in 13 or something like that um but i'll ding them a little bit so if it wasn't for that fake punt, I'd probably be giving the special teams like a B plus. Uh, so I'll probably knock it down to a B minus. So overall, not a good performance for the Falcons, but they managed to do just enough to win, uh, particularly getting those stops in the red zone. Although, again, I think, you know, we'll see what the all 22 says. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of that was owed to Tim Boyle being Tim Boyle. Uh, so we will get into more of this conversation about the Falcons talent and, you know, Basically, my big takeaway is that, you know, the Lions were the untalented team that looked well coached uh, this past Sunday, as opposed to the narrative that says the Falcons are this untalented team. But, hey, they're well coached. And I just didn't necessarily see that. And I'll explain that as we wrap up today's Locked on Falcons podcast. But before we get there, guys, I thank you for making Locked on Falcons your first listen each and every day. And a recommendation for your second listen is the ultimate college football playoff preview. And if you have been subscribed to the NFL season preview, the NBA season preview, uh, you were probably still subscribed to that ultimate college football playoff previews on the same feed. And if you're not subscribed to it, just search ultimate college football playoff preview 2021 on whatever your podcast platform is. They kicked off with a sugar bowl preview this past Friday, and it's going to be running all week long to get you guys geared up for this upcoming weekend's college football playoff action. And I know you Georgia Bulldog fans certainly uh, will be listening to that. So go check out the ultimate college football playoff preview currently running on the Lockdown Podcast Network. So it is the holiday season. And speaking of college football playoffs, let's talk about Bet Online, who's been, you know, killing it all season long, being that number one spot for all your betting and sports action this season. But it's just not about the sports. It's just not about football. It's about basketball and hockey and boxing and UFC and even Vegas casino games. You can find it all at Bet Online at their new updated desktop or mobile website at betonline.ag and go there, check it out, sign up. And when you do, make sure you use the promo code locked on. You'll get a 50% welcome bonus. That means if you deposit 400 bucks, you get $200 in free money to play with money that you can use towards the Falcons against the Falcons towards the Bulldogs against the Bulldogs. However you feel uh, in this coming up season, obviously we're in the midst of a whole bunch of bowl game so go check out bet online to get in on that action don't wait take advantage of all the amazing offers available at bet online where the game starts so my final thoughts again i I don't have any bold takeaways from this game i i was disappointed i had low expectations for the falcons going in this game you know my expectations my final prediction for the score was like 24 to 19 it was 20 to 16 so basically take away you know one score or whatever for each team and that was about it but you guys know i have low expectations uh and so when the team fails to meet those then you know i'm not going to be particularly happy so um you know we can sit here and say it's a resilient win and all these various things but basically like i see a lions team that when we talk about lacking talent like the lions really show that right And I know that there's going to be, we're going to sit here and tell ourselves, oh, the Falcons talent. Again, I'm not trying to sit here and say the Falcons are loaded with talent, but compared to the Lions, it's like, it's not even close. You know what I'm saying? Like, these are not two teams on the same footing from a talent standpoint. Um, And to me, the Lions 
were a team that looked like a untalented team that was well coached today. And again, we can certainly question Dan Campbell's decision to settle for that field goal at the end of the game. Um, but outside of that, the Lions did like they got 99% of the way there to how they wanted to play this game with Tim Boyle and and basically nothing, um, you know, from a talent standpoint on that roster. And like we're sitting here complaining about multiple Falcon Pro Bowl snubs and the Lions wish they had a Pro Bowl. Like it, maybe Frank Rag now, if he was healthy, he could be a Pro Bowl or Penny so I knows played well over the last like month or two. Um, but outside of that, you're like, you're not talking about anybody that's in that Pro Bowl conversation with the Lions and the Falcons, you know, had like half a dozen guys that people were making the argument for for a Pro Bowl spot or whatever the case may be. So like the talent level is not even close, you know, and so like. Again, I'm not trying to sit here and be like, oh, Arthur Smith's a terrible coach or anything like that. I just I just did not see a particularly well coached team. This to me is a, a classic case of a team, like again, not a super talent laid team, but just played down to a much lower level of competition. You know, like just compare, like, you know, Tim Boyle. Basically, it would be the equivalent of the Falcons starting Josh Rosen and and you know, nearly winning a game. They again, as I said earlier, this game was exactly how the Lions drew it up. And they got 99% of the way there. They were literally one yard away from winning this football game, uh, if not for Foye Olukun making uh, a spectacular play at the end of the game. So kudos to Foye Olukun for making that great play. But, um, you know, it's hard for me to sit here and be like, hey, this is a well-coached f- football day. Like, look at, the, look at you know, and, and I'll, I'll just, you know, outside of the Tim Boyle-ness, um, I'll just use one example of the talent disparity that the Falcons have versus the Lions. Like, the Lions... Um, due to TJ Hawkinson being out of the lineup, their starting tight end was Brock Wright. Brock Wright was an undrafted free agent uh, out of Notre Dame. He was a backup at Notre Dame. He had seven career catches at Notre Dame. It's basically like, you know, you guys remember Ryan Becker, who we picked up in this offseason, who was a blocking tight end at San Jose State, who had like four career catches. That's basically what the Lions were starting at tight end this year, at this week. Right, their backup was a division three undrafted free agent. Right, you know, just pick any practice squad, you know, John Rainey or whatever the BYU guy, uh, or even the probably not again, division three versus BYU. And, and like that's who the Fal- the Lions had at their two tight end spots. Meanwhile, the Falcons have Kyle Pitts and Hayden Hurts, two first round picks. And we're sitting here trying to pretend that, oh, yeah, the Falcons are this super untalented team. I'm just like, look, I, again, I'm not saying the Falcons are one of the most talent laden rosters, but like, there is a big difference between, um, you know, where the Lions are from a talent standpoint and to me where the Falcons are. And that's just one example uh, that that I'm using. But, um, you know, it's just it's just disappointing um, to see the Falcons play as poorly as they did. You know, again, the lone bright spot we have is, you know, Kyle Pitts is on track to, to have a historic rookie season or whatever the case may be, potentially. Um, and and set a record today for the Falcons. Again, that's positive for you, Luke. And hey, great job for you uh, doing your thing. Special teams, you guys have been killing it over the last month. Outside of that, I just don't have a whole lot of positive to say. And again, I, I know it's a win and I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll get some feedback uh, about, again, I don't think the sky is falling by any means, guys, but I just came away from this game being like, oh, this team is bad. And it's not simply because they lack talent. It's just like, they just do not play up at all and like it's just it's so tiresome to me and because this was a a regular complaint on the podcast that i had when dan quinn was here um and even to a lesser extent when mike smith was here even though we weren't really podcasting that as much back then but it was just like the opposing teams always are able to execute their game plan and falcons never execute their game plan. like it never goes the way that the falcons wanted to go right every the opposing team no matter how bad they are, are going to be able to do the thing they want to do. And again, that's why I sit here and I say like, yeah, man, Dan Campbell, again, did his thing. Because like, if you were going to draw up a play, okay, how how are we going to be in a position uh, to win this game at the at the very end? You were drawing it exactly how they drew it up. And they went out in there and did their thing. They were able to run the football. They were able to get stops on defense. You know, they did everything they wanted, they needed to do to have a chance to win this game. And the Falcons basically like let them do it. And like I, I look at that and I just go, okay, like, you know, I, I just really hope like obviously we're gonna need to see this talent level improve uh in the offseason, obviously. Uh, again, as I've said many times, you know, they this team has holes and in, in in the potential to upgrade pretty much every position uh outside of kicker punter and now long snapper thanks to thomas morstead. We'll see what happens with Morstead in the future. So they have basically every position that is not 
uh, one of their specialists they could upgrade on offense and defense. Um, so no one's sitting here arguing that this team is a talent laden team, but I just sit here and I, I really do hope this team becomes a much better coached football team than they have been throughout this season and, and particularly on Sunday. That's sort of my final thoughts on it. So not much else is to say. We'll have a guest come on tomorrow, Mike Rothstein of ESPN, give his thoughts. Maybe he has a much more positive glowing outlook for this team. He covered not only the Lions, but now covers the Falcons, obviously. Uh, so we'll see what he has to say about it. I'm sure he'll have uh, – Look, I guess you can't get any more negative than I'm <laughs> – I mean, I'm just, it's just, it's just so mediocre to me, like, you know, but it is what it is. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that guys. Uh, and again, it's bowl season. So if you're trying to make some money on all these bowl games, you know, the best place that you should subscribe to that's the locked on best podcast. Cause Lee Sterling is giving you those daily picks, those blowout specials and that lock of the day. And you know, Lee's going to have it coming for all the bowl games that are happening this week and certainly for the playoff game and make sure you check out that ultimate college football playoff preview 2021 on its own feed uh, on whatever podcast platform you subscribe. So whatever you're checking out locked on Falcons right now, go check out that ultimate college football playoff preview right now on that same platform. So uh, appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed already to locked on Falcons, on youtube make sure you do that if you want to provide your feedback and tell me why aaron why you got to be so negative or hey aaron you didn't go hard enough uh you know by all means i'm, I'm open to your feedback of course you can leave a comment on lockdown falcons youtube you can send an email to lockdown falcons at mail.com you can of course hit me up on social media such as twitter and facebook at lockdown falcons as well so guys i appreciate you for tuning in i i wish I had much more positive things to say about this team, but this to me was a very forgettable game and and what is probably going to ultimately be a pretty forgettable season for the Falcons. But hey, they're seven and eight. And hey, you know, it's impossible. You you can't be a poorly coached team if you've won seven games with this roster, right? You know, they just don't have any talent. But, uh, you know, that's what we're going to tell ourselves. So, hey, guys, appreciate it. Hope you had a great Christmas, and I hope you continue to have a great holiday week as we guys get you geared up for this upcoming week uh, with two more games left for this very forgettable Falcon season. Appreciate it, guys. Till then.